believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Bryn. Now we can have that first slide. So how did the Apostles' Creed originate? Now, to answer that question, I want to share with you how baptisms occurred in the first few centuries, and this was documented in a third century document. And I'm quoting. On the eve of Easter Sunday, a group of believers had stayed up all night praying and reading the scriptures. The most important day of their life was approaching. When the rooster crowed at dawn, they led out to a pool of flowing water. They removed their clothes. The women let down their hair and removed their jewellery. They renounce Satan and are anointed from head to foot with oil. They are led naked into the water. Then they are asked a question. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? They reply, I believe, and they are plunged into the water and raised up again. Then they're asked a second question. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was born of the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin and was crucified under Pontius Pilate and was dead and buried and rose on the third day, alive from the dead and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead? To which they respond, I believe, and they're plunged under again and raised up. And then they're asked a third question. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church and the resurrection of the dead? And they reply a third time, I believed. And they're immersed again and raised again. And when they emerge from water, they're anointed with oil. They're clothed. They're blessed. And they're led into the assembly of believers where they will share in the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, for the first time. Then they're led out into the world to bear witness and serve Jesus their Lord. That's how baptisms happened back then. And no doubt if you were one of those who were baptised in PCC down at Sutton's Beach either last year or the year before, you're probably breathing a great sigh of relief that we've dispensed with the tradition of baptising naked. <laughs> yes, I can see the relief on your faces. <laughs> but this is where the Apostles Creed had its roots long before the canon of scripture came together hundreds of years before this is how the Apostles Creed came about they didn't have the Bible as we know it and this became, these words became a powerful way of at their baptism declaring I believe. The English word creed comes from the Latin word credo, which simply means that. Believe. I believe. And this creed is essentially just a really profound statement of the heart of what we believe as a people of God. I personally believe it's a shame that so many of the evangelical and charismatic and Pentecostal churches have, um, have discarded saying the creeds in the church. And in fact, there's one particularly evangelical denomination who proudly has as their motto, quote, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. The irony is, A, that statement's not found in the Bible, and the other irony is that's actually a creed. <laughs> They're actually saying what they believe, so that's actually a creed. <sighs> However, I am sympathetic also 
because I understand and I've heard so many testimonies of many who have come out of the more liturgical denominations where it feels like it's said week after week and it's just mindless repetition and it doesn't mean anything and they uh, just uh, rejoice in the, the freedom without doing that. And if it is mindless repetition, yeah, well, I get that. But here's the thing, if we don't understand what we're saying, it is that. But when, when we actually understand what we are confessing in these words, it becomes such a powerful conviction that the Holy Spirit can use to strengthen our faith. Where, when we're there week after week affirming and confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord and God is our Father, that the Holy Spirit is Christ within us, that the church is a community he's ordained to belong to and that he will come again, that's a powerful thing. That's why I'm, I'm suggesting that every week during this ser series, we will together say either the um, Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. I'm not suggesting we, we do it every week because that's not our tradition. But I actually have a sense that when we truly understand what we're saying, we will want to confess that perhaps more often than we currently do. So, how did the creeds originate? How did they come about? And how do they relate to what we now know as the Bible? Now, I want to say this teaching today may seem a little bit more like a church history lecture that belongs in a theological college rather than a sermon on Sunday mornings. But if you can hang in with me through this week, I believe in the long term it will be helpful if we have a bit of this background. Then we'll really get into it as we go, you know, phrase by phrase uh, through, the, through the creed. So anyway, the, the first point it's important to make. So there may be a lot to absorb here as well. Listen again on YouTube if you want to, or if you don't have access to that, I'm more than happy to make my notes from this morning available to you if, if that helps. But the first thing I really want to say is creeds are biblical. There are actually creeds in the Bible. One of the most well-known creeds of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5, Hear, O Israel... The Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. That's a creed. Another one is Paul's famous hymn in Philippians 2. Humble himself, obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him and made him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a creed. That's a creed. I should be an auctioneer, shouldn't I? <laughs> Soul. <laughs> Soul, thanks, Tom. <laughs> That's a creed. So there were creeds in the Bible, but these creeds were developed by the early church. They were actually existed. These creeds existed long before the canon of scripture was endorsed. Yes, uh, the gospels were circulating. Yes, Paul's letters were circulating, but they didn't have the word as we had it today. There were actually literally hundreds of pieces of literature that they had to decide what becomes the canon of scripture and what doesn't. And so it was the work of the early church fathers, the early councils of the church to prayerfully discern under the guidance of the Holy Spirit which became part of the canon of scripture and not. And these creeds, particularly the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene's Creed and two others I'll mention, were critical in discerning what became part of scripture and what didn't. And the other thing it's important to know is these creeds were developed in order to address heresy. Because rest assured, we read the good bits in Acts of the Spirit poured out and thousands being added the numbers. But guess what? There are as many weird and wonderful and kooky people around back then trying to preach heresy as there were today. 
And so these creatures, just a few examples, there were the Ebionites who claimed that um, an angel or a heavenly Christ figure entered the body of human Jesus at his baptism. That was a big teaching. You might have heard of a heresy called Docetism. They denied that Jesus actually had a physical body. And Gnost the Gnostics, you've probably heard of Gnosticism where a wicked demigod created the world and Jesus came to save us from this body by releasing us from our, releasing our souls and it involved having secret knowledge to attain it. So they're just a few examples. All of this was going around. And so the creeds were developed, friends, to draw a line in the sand. They were developed to distinguish faith that was rooted in scripture and faith that was just scripture distorted by pagan philosophies. So that's why they were developed. It was really important. And there were four key creeds developed in the first 500 years. The first of them, as I said, was the Apostles' Creed, the one we just said today. That, as I said, has emerged in Rome as a statement of faith used at baptism, as I said, about the second or century. And it is still used in baptismal services today in Anglican, Catholic, Uniting and Lutheran churches in Australia and Presbyterian and Methodist churches worldwide and other denominations as well. Still used as a statement of faith at baptism. But what about the Nicene Creed? And if you've come and worshipped in an Anglican, Catholic or Lutheran church or other church, you'll be used to saying, and your uniting church, you'll be used to saying the Nicene Creed, if not every week on Communion Sunday. So what's the difference? Okay, this creed came about in, it began in 325, when the Emperor Constantine, that's the Roman Emperor who got converted, he became a Christian, called the Council of Bishops to deal with the teaching of a rogue elder called Arius. He was a very popular preacher at the time, but he was teaching that Jesus was a created being like God. He was, Jesus is real, but God created him. He was not the same as God the Father. So the bishops met in a city called Nicaea and they worked on this and they expanded the Apostles' Creed to affirm that Jesus was truly God. He was the same essence as the Father. And that was the first version of the, Apost the Nicene Creed. But there was another controversy, a guy called Apollinarius, he taught the opposite. He was saying Jesus wasn't truly fully human. So they met again in the city of Constantinople, now Istanbul in Turkey, in 381, and expanded it even more to affirm that. So this updated version of the Nicene Creed from 381, while the language may have changed to fit the vernacular of the time over the years, this is the same creed that is said in many denominations throughout the world, and guess what? Those that may not say it in their worship believe every word of it. This is the essence of what defines the Christian church in all of its various varieties, whether from Greek Orthodox to Pentecostal to Roman Catholic to Brethren to Baptist to Lutheran to Uniting Church to Anglican to wherever, we Seventh-day Adventists, all of those, we believe these. We, in essence, we believe these, the heart of these. This was what distinguishes us. This is what distinguishes all of those denominations from, say, the Jehovah's Witness um, or the Mormons. They cannot, they do not affirm all of the aspects of that because they do not believe in the Trinity. They do not believe that Jesus was uh, fully God. So therefore, we... We love them and pray for them as children of God, but they are not part of the Christian communion. This is where we draw the line in the sand, and this is why these creeds are so important. So, matter of interest, let's just have a look at the differences that are added in the creed at Nicaea. So, the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In the Nicene Creed, we believe in one God, the Father, one, did you hear the difference? We believe in one God, that's important, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
That's the difference That's that they add there. The Apostles' Creed, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. The Nicene Creed expands that. We believe in, again, one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, not made, not created, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. That's scriptural, isn't it, John? The word was with God and all things were made through him. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate for the Virgin Mary and became truly human. So they're the uh, additions that affirm Jesus and God the Father are one. They're different essence, you know, they're different beings, but they are one. Jesus is fully God, fully human. Okay? So they're the important things. And the same with the Holy Spirit, the last one. The Apostles' Creed just says, I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified and has spoken through the prophets. So they made it crystal clear, the Trinity, Jesus fully human, fully divine. And that creed, as I said, continues to be um, affirmed in the church today, either in public worship or um, is, is undergirds the the theology of all of the Christian church that uh, bears the name as followers of Jesus. So that's why that's so important. Just as a matter of interest, there were two more creeds that aren't used in public worship anywhere because they're too long, but were very significant. And the first one is the Chalcedonian Creed, also known as the Chalcedonian Definition. This was... Um, this meeting was at a place called Chelsea held in 451 because there was still ongoing debate about Jesus' two natures. How do the divine and human relate? And uh, so they really did some more work on that. And then the final one, the Athanasian Creed. This one's really long. This was formulated in AD 500 and it did further work to flesh out the Trinity and the person of Christ uh, even more so. So as I said, they're too long, they're not used in public worship, but students of theology still study these creeds. If you're keen, I can give you access to them. They're written in a language that you might need to read them 20 times to understand them, but they're good stuff. <laughs> so how then do the creeds relate to the canon of Scripture? Well, to put it simply, as I said, it took the best part of 400 years before the Bible as we know it now. Well, I should say the Bible as we know it as Protestants. There is some, a few other books, 1st, 2nd, Maccabees and others, which we call the Apocrypha, that are accepted in the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic Bible. We've got no issue with them, but there was just a debate later on, is this part of the scripture or not? Um, it's no big deal. Um, there's a whole lot of other writings called the Pseudepigrapha, which is a lot of weird and wonderful stuff that didn't make it in. But anyway, of course, the writing of the, the Torah, the law, the Old Testament, the Kings and the Psalms, they already existed. They were the Hebrew scriptures, which the people of old followed. The Jewish Bible, we could call it. Okay, the, what we call the Old Testament. But the process of discerning of all the gospel writings, because there was more than the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, there are other gospels according to so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and there are other letters as well besides Paul's letters. The process of discerning those, as I said, didn't happen until the late 300s AD. It was very, very interesting that there were some writings known as the Shepherd of Hermas, First Clement and the Didache, who almost made it into the canon. You'll be very interested to know that Hebrews, Second Peter and Revelation only just made it in. There was a lot of debate as to whether they would actually make it in. We can't imagine them not being there now, but anyway, it's part of the process that went through. The point is this, with all the writings that are available, these creeds 
played a very important part in helping the early church fathers guided by the Holy Spirit to discern what was in and what was out. Because as we read this creed, the overarching narrative of the God, the life, birth, death, resurrection of Jesus who would come again and the church, they're all there. So that became a guide. Does it align with this? Is it Christ central? Is it Christocentric? Is it honouring and does it align with all of these aspects? So it became a plumb line to help the, council of, uh, the councils of the church discern. So they paid a really important role. That's why there's value of uh, saying them today because of that history and because of the essence. So what is, now that we, and a question that's often asked is, okay, but now we have the Bible, what's the value of the creeds? And that's a valid argument by some who don't use the creeds. We don't need them anymore. We have the Bible. What's the value? I want to suggest a few things. I want to suggest that the creeds help us grow in our faith. Yes, as people who follow Jesus, that to be able to have the discipline of reading and meditating and reflecting and studying the whole word of God is important. But there is so much in here, there is such value sometimes in just confessing what is the essence of our faith, what is the heart of our faith. To even be able to explain to someone, someone said to me, would the Apostles' Creed be great to lead someone through and to make a commitment to the Lord? I think it was you, Bernie. Uh, absolutely. See, to be able to explain the Christian faith briefly and the essence of it, these creeds are great. You know, we can't explain the whole rich truth in the Bible in one sitting, but these creeds provide a great affirmation of her faith and if we say them regularly with conviction they become a part of us the other reason that's important is the creeds affirm the unity of the church as I've said before there's so much isn't it that we don't agree on theologically there's some that's why there are different denominations and different expressions uh, different understandings of worship different understandings of theology and various things there's so many areas where we're different but this is where we're all united. And if we can say this is what unites us, we can celebrate our differences. We can celebrate our diversity without getting sidetracked as the enemy loves it when the church starts fighting itself because that just, that, he loves that because that's just such a shocking witness. So if we can celebrate, the more we can affirm, you know, what we hold together, you know, that, that means that if we wanted to, we could, choose, we could go in to a Greek Orthodox church and worship. It would, after pieces, worship on a Sunday morning. That would seem different. But we are one. Because this, you know, the, at the heart of it, it unites us. We could go into Hillsong or a Baptist or an Anglican or Lutheran. They would be different. But undergirding, we are united by the Jesus and the Spirit and affirm these central truths. And thirdly, they remind us, they remind us that as Christians, we're part of God's plan for the new. He will come again to judge the living and the death. The one holy Catholic Church and the life of the, world to come, life of the world to come. By the way, Catholic, you know the true meaning of that is universal. That word just means universal. It's not referring to the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic just seems, it's not a Roman Catholic denomination. Catholic just means universal. So the one universal church. Okay? Um, that's what that means. But when we say this, it reminds us we are part of God's plan for the renewal of creation we're part of God's plan for the life of the world to come we affirm that every time we affirm these creeds 
just to be able to say, and it's interesting, the Nicene Creed says we believe, or the newer versions, we, I, doesn't matter, because even when we say I, we're part of the body of Christ, we're saying it. We has the more communal. But whether we say I believe or we believe, that's a powerful statement for us as the people of God. We live in a world where truth has become relative. The postmodern era, as they call it, which began 30 years ago, began this subtle philosophy is truth is what's important to you. Truth matters only in what's true to you. And what happens once we go down that line, friends, we lose any sort of anchor. We can believe what we like. And it was very, very interesting. I've had many conversations with young people who absolutely reject postmodern philosophy because they, I've heard testimonies of those who were part of it and they say, I just got lost. I was lost in who I was. There was no anchor for me to anchor. So whether you believe in, you know, uh, of course we're preaching this because we believe that, that, that Christ is the way to the Father, so that's it. But my point is to be able to say, I believe, and anchor our conviction to a truth, as I said, gives us something to weather the storms, the uncertainty that we face. So that's why I'm absolutely believing there is great value. Next week, we will have a look. We'll begin to unpack, I believe in God, one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Oh, there's a lot in that. There's a few sermons in that alone, but I'm going to keep it to one. But there's so value in to be able to say, yes, I believe. I believe. Amen.